Alex, I think we are ready to start and good morning, uh, afternoon or evening because you are joining us really from the extreme regions. It may be very early morning for some of you, late evening for others. So we are very happy to have you with us today for our uh, monthly peer exchange webinar. For those who are um, joining us regularly, you know that this is really more of an informal exchange between uh, colleagues from different entities, NGOs, civil society, UN entities, and we come together to discuss a topic, a topic uh, which is today around uh, advocacy in protracted crises for communities living under non-state armed groups control. And for those of you who have been with us in the last uh, peer exchange webinar, which took place, I think, 28th of January, you would remember that this topic was suggested and proposed by one of the participants and that um, put it forward. And we then followed up as the Human Rights Engagement Task Team along with Advocacy Task Team. And this is why we are here today. So. This is also an encouragement uh, to all of you. If you have some topics that uh, you feel would be relevant to you or would you would like to discuss more broadly with other colleagues in the field or with experts on the topic, we would be very happy to follow up um, on this uh, video. So you uh, already know probably the ground rules for those exchanges. I would like to ask Peter, thank you for the next uh, slide. As many of you already did, grateful if you can drop a line in the chat introducing yourself, just saying who you are, where you work, where you are based, so that we see um, who is with us online around this virtual table. And we will have together about one and a half hours <clears throat> maximum. And we would really encourage you to use the chat also to drop some ideas, examples, reactions, questions. We will be constantly monitoring the chat, as you know, so we will be bringing back those elements and information questions also to the panelists so that we can have a discussion after the presentation. OK, so this is uh, uh, just setting the scene, but I would like to present you today's speakers because we have a very varied panel today. Um, I mentioned briefly that today's event is co-organized between two task teams under the Global Protection Cluster, the Human Rights Engagement Task Team, but also the Advocacy Task Team. So we will have Alison Kent, uh, who will do the opening of our today's event, who is the co-chair of the Advocacy Task Team. And then we will go directly to the good practices from the field. So we will hear uh, different perspectives from different entities and at different levels. But we have, a, I think, very appealing and beautiful mix of examples uh, that will be shared today with us. First of all, Pascal Mongar from Geneva Call, who will uh, get us started, followed by Julian Watkinson based in Colombia with Ocha. Then going to a more broader holistic uh, um, perspective from global level from Kiran Kotari from Save the Children. And zooming in more specifically to Mali context with contributions from Mali protection cluster Sabrina Amirat, but also colleagues from Yunmas, uh, Nora Achkar, and um, Ocha Mali, who will complement this perspective in Mali, represented by Gbaka Frank Dakuri. So as you see, a very diverse uh, set of examples and uh, good practices uh, that are complementary. And then during our questions and answers, we will also hear from a local NGO based in Yemen, a local NGO called Tangir, and our colleague Jamal Abdo, will make also an intervention. Voila, so here is the program for today. But colleagues, I would really strongly encourage you to use the chat. You can also raise your hand if you would like to make an intervention during the questions and answer sec uh, section, and we will um, uh, take it forward uh, to the panelists. I stop here 
and I give the floor directly to Alison Ken to please open our event uh, now. Over to you, Alison. Thank you so much, Valérie. And yeah, really nice to be with you all today and very much looking forward to the exchange and to the discussion. So I'll be brief, but um, really, I just wanted to say a few words about why both the GPC's advocacy task team and the human rights engagement task team were really keen to organize the session today um, and to also just outline how it links with some of our ongoing work and our focus this year. So I think as many of you know, both of the task teams have been working together for a while now on a range of different initiatives, um, ultimately looking to strengthen or further strengthen the human rights and advocacy elements of the amazing protection work that's been done by colleagues across you know, 32 cluster operations at global levels with local partners um, and other protection allies. And so as part of this, both task teams you know, really committed to driving forward the use of the full range of advocacy approaches and tactics that can ultimately play such a critical role in supporting the protection and rights of communities in crisis. And this includes really the full spectrum, you know, from quiet diplomacy and engagement with armed actors to using global human rights mechanisms, directly lobbying Security Council members, awareness raising campaigns, you know, etc. There really is a wide range of actions um, that we want to further promote and leverage as part of driving stronger protection outcomes. Um, and so I think, you know, a big focus for the two task teams with this um, area of work has been about unpacking learnings and looking at good practices, emerging good practices in terms of how we can use some of these different advocacy approaches um, to support the protection of communities, understanding what's working, what can be adapted, um, as well as looking at how local and international actors, how human rights and protection actors, how we can collaborate better, how we can complement each other um, in these sort of shared endeavors. Um, and so, as Valérie mentioned, when during the last webinar, our colleague uh, Julien raised this question of how can advocacy be used in the midst of protracted crises um, where communities are living under the control of non-state armed groups, we thought, OK, perfect. It's a good opportunity to bring colleagues together for more sharing and exchange on this kind of advocacy work. Um, and we know that the issue of protection for communities living under the control of non-state armed groups is a big one. Um, um, the ICRC has figures from 2020 where it estimates that 60 to 80 million people are living in territories exclusively controlled by armed groups. Um, and we're seeing this very much as a reality across many, many cluster operations. Um, you know, Central African Republic, Iraq, Nigeria, South Sudan, Mali, Haiti, and it goes on. Um, and to mention that, of course, many communities living in these um, areas controlled by non-state armed groups are under the control for often many years. Um, humanitarian access can often be quite limited. Um, and while in certain cases there might be some basic governance functions that the non-state armed groups are carrying out, some service delivery, tax collection, etc., it's also very clear that insecurity, violence, you know, human rights abuses, protection incidents are also very widespread in these contexts. Um, and another point is that, of course, these operating environments are very complex for humanitarian and protection actors. Um, and I think many of these uh, contexts really bring out some of the perceived and also very real tensions and trade offs between things like access and advocacy, maintaining relationships with host governments, staff safety considerations. You know, it's all very pronounced um, in many of these situations. So I'm very much looking forward to the discussion and exchange on these issues and, and looking at how advocacy can be better used to strengthen protection in these contexts. Um, and with that, I'll pass it back to you, Valérie. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Alison, for introducing us to the topic, uh, giving us the chapeau, but also um, what I really liked and remember from your intervention now is how you make the links between advocacy, protection impact uh, and uh, outcomes as well as the human rights aspect and how it all fits together. So this is very important and I think this also reflects the collaboration between the task teams, the human rights engagement task team and the advocacy task team. So 
Thank you so much, Alison. And with that, I think we are ready actually to go to our uh, good practices examples and hear from colleagues. And I would like to invite Pascal, please, uh, to get us started. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, I'm very happy to be part of this discussion on a very important topic. So I have prepared two, uh, two slides uh, that will illustrate uh, my presentation. Um, so first, maybe, um, I mean, I need to say that my reflection or perspectives are mainly drawn from my experience with Geneva Cole over the past 20 years. Um, as you may know, Geneva Cole, uh, our mission is to engage directly with non-state armed groups to advocate the respect for international human law, IHL, and the protection of civilians. And we engage armed groups both directly, but also indirectly through what we call actors of influence. And these actors of influence include community actors that are living in areas under the control of armed groups, such as uh, CBOs, uh, community-based organizations, elders, religious leaders, opinion leaders, youth, women groups, but also uh, broad refugee communities and diaspora groups. So we um, we really try to influence the behavior of armed groups indirectly and directly. And as you know, many armed groups have some sort of constituency or support base. And part of our engagement strategy is to identify and mobilize such actors to influence the behavior of armed groups. And we have used this approach in many contexts over the past 20 years, in particular in situations when direct engagement has been difficult or impossible or stalling. We have tried to train community partners, so we have identified and, and then trained community partners, uh, the variety of actors I just mentioned before, on IHL norms and negotiation skills in order to enhance their capacity to engage with armed groups on protection issues such as such as soldiers, sexual violence, um, health care or, or mine action. And our assumption is that uh, when community actors are better equipped in terms of knowledge of the rights of communities, knowledge of international law, they are in better position to advocate for their respect. And we have used also community radio stations, social media and other channels to disseminate uh, tailor-made messages and to raise public awareness, especially in areas under the control of armed groups. Um, so, so far we have, over the past 20 years, experienced mixed results, I must say. Um, this is not an exhaustive view, but just to give you a kind of, of sense of the trends. Um, I would say that in, in some cases, uh, community actors were very instrumental and helped us a lot to persuade armed groups to release Chai soldiers or support mine clearance in areas under their control. So that has been a very, I would say, effective way to add pressure on armed groups to change behavior or facilitate human action. Uh, and it happens in different uh, areas, such for example in, in, in Iraq or in South, Southern Sudan. But in other cases, um, community actors, especially when they were very much um, close to the group, were just justifying the behavior of armed groups and dismissing IHL violations as government propaganda or uh, enemy propaganda. And this happened, for example, with the Tamil diaspora when we we're engaging with the LTTE back uh, in, the, in, the, in the early 20s, uh, 2000, sorry, um, in, in Sri Lanka, uh, the Tamil diaspora, which is uh, which quite important in a number of Western countries, was not very much, you know, um, I would say was quite conservative in terms of um, acknowledging the need for, um, for influencing on a positive way uh, uh, the LTT. In other contexts, especially in the context of divided society, uh, some community actors are considered biased by the armed group, partisan, not really, you know, supportive, and so have very little leverage on the armed groups. So it's very important, I think, to really um, identify the, the profile of the group, but also who may have some uh, potential influence. And in our experience, I would say the level of influence depends on, on various factors. So I mentioned a few um, on the slide, the type of the armed group, 
uh, especially to what extent it is community embedded. It has some kind of social cons constituency or basis, but also, as you mentioned uh, before, uh, whether or not it exercises some governance function and service delivery. That I think is very important in terms of uh, potential leverage. Also, what is important is the profile of the community actor. So it's ideological, ethnic, religious proximity with the armed group, the legitimacy of this actor, the personal links that he may have uh, with the leadership of the armed group, all that matters. But also there are many other, other, other factors that may influence the level of influence of, of community actors, the, the conflict dynamics, the potential uh, entry points, incentives that the armed groups may have to uh, facilitate human action or, or respect the rights of the communities, um, whether or not there is a peace process. So the timing is also very important. So all these factors uh, show um, the need for a, a solid knowledge base to inform strategies of, of engagement with non-state armed groups. If we want to really um, you know, engage effectively with armed groups through these actors of influence, we need really to have a, a serious uh, knowledge base. And this is exactly, um, this is the, the, the second slide, um, this is exactly what um, the Generating Respect project is aiming with regards to religious leaders. Um, so there are many examples, uh, known examples, of religious leaders who have successfully influenced the behavior of armed groups. And I mentioned uh, the example uh, on the slides in Iraq of Ayatollah uh, al-Sistani uh, in Najaf, who issued a fatwa in 2015 in response to abuses committed by the, the PMF, the Popular Mobilization Forces. And his advice and guidance to the fighters on the battlefield that he issued specified acts that are per not permitted under Islamic law, Shia law, most of which, uh, which are consistent with IHL, uh, such as the respect of civilians. And this fatwa, as we can see on the picture, has influenced directly PMF um, soldiers. So the Generating Respect uh, Research Project aims to explore exactly uh, these two aspects. What factors may religious leaders uh, make, sorry, religious leaders influential, and how they can effectively influence the behavior of parties to armed conflict. They look at both non-state armed groups, but also state uh, armed forces. And Geneva Code is a partner of this project, which is led by the, the York University. You have the, the link of the companion website of the research project. There are a number of case studies that are underway in, uh, in Colombia, in Libya, in Mali, Myanmar, Syria and Yemen, and the result will be available by the end of the year. And to conclude, uh, our experience show that community engagement, this indirect engagement as we call it, may be a, a valuable approach to add pressure uh, on, on armed groups, to advocate you know, uh, uh, more effectively compliance with IHL. But yet, we often know little about the dynamics existing between armed groups and communities living in areas under the control, especially how community actors influence armed groups, these different factors. And these dynamics uh, between civilians and armed groups are often sought in terms of coercion, victimization, violence, but they are often far more complex than that and often overlook the civilian agency and, and potential of influence. And this is something that I, this research project focusing on religious leaders, but I think it's important that, um, I mean, to have mentioned that there are other projects by the Center of, of Study of Armed Groups uh, hosted by ODI in London, are looking at these dynamics between civilians and, and armed groups. And that would be, I think, quite um, useful to inform more effective engagement strategy with armed groups for the better respect of the rights of, of communities living in uh, areas under the control. So I, I will stop here and, and we'll be very happy to exchange and, and respond to any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pascal, for sharing uh, those insights with us and also putting some recommendations forward and the importance of the analysis and the profile of the actors we have in front and know 
one size fit all approach at all, but also what you mentioned, the nuanced approach of using proxy uh, stakeholders, uh, influencing uh, those actors and much co more complex and uh, broader network of uh, advocacy um, elements that you, you have outlined for us here. So thank you so much. I'm sure there will be questions coming also your way, but now we will go to a country level example we will move to Colombia and we will hear from Julian, Julian Watkinson from OCHA about his experience uh, uh, in engaging uh, at a country level in, uh, in Colombia. So over to you please Julian and colleagues apologies Julian cannot put the camera on because of connection but uh, uh, hopefully the line will be clear. So over to you Julian. Thank you so much, Valerie, and hello, colleagues, and thank you again for, for being so spontaneous and organizing this call after my, my small little um, last message and last meeting. Based in Colombia, we have two initiatives which are focusing on access and the nexus of humanitarian uh, operations and human rights. First one is our awareness campaign on humanitarian principles, international humanitarian law. In Colombia, since 2016, since the peace agreement, we're seeing a multiplication of armed groups and with little knowledge of international humanitarian law and the knowledge about humanitarian operations and who we actually are. So in the last years we saw an increasing trend in attacks and threats to our operations in the country, both with NGOs and UN agencies. And also um, quite, quite severe is that even community leaders, which were our best source for the access in recent years, lose their access and their contact to armed groups due to the multiplication of armed groups and due to their dynamic operations since they are fighting for territory control. So armed groups are changing their control quite frequently in the country. To respond to this uh, changing um, operational context, even though I have to highlight that the context and access in Colombia is still certainly better than in other operations, but still we see um, a, a downside trend in, in the country. So what we are going to do is to actually broadcast um, ex radio campaigns, small radio spots of 30 seconds in the majority of departments where we have the highest access restrictions on, on the three principles of neutrality, impartiality and independence. Um, using local radio stations in the most conflict affected um, areas in the country. And we are using over 60 radio stations and we are also translating those spots into indigenous languages to, to increase our uh, awareness both of the community and of the armed groups and actors on our operations in, in the country. On the left side you see the map of access restrictions and we are seeing a downtrend, especially in the Pacific Coast and the border to Venezuela. On the right side, the small map, you see where we are actually broadcasting our radio spots, so the overlap is quite, quite strong, but we still have I have to say that this is only the first start. We need to um, focus more on, on actually socializing on what we're doing to the communities and the armed groups so that we don't lose our, our, our access to the communities. Next slide, please. For today's topic, it's even, even more relevant, is our research study on the human turn impact of living under the influence and control of non-state armed groups in the country. Even though, as you probably know, OCHA is using most, uh, most of the times the numbers of mass placements and confinements, which have increased in recent years considerably, but still those numbers do not reflect the actual impact of the number of people living under the influence of armed groups. So what we did first was a mapping exercise to quantify actually how many people live under the, under the influence and or control of armed groups. On the left side you see the map, you might also see that the colors reflect actually different groups. So we have a diverse range of groups in the country, which is increasing the complexity of the Colombian context. And the seven, we, we estimated in the last year that roughly 7 million people live under the influence and our control. We still have a few gaps, to be honest. For example, we cannot differentiate between influence and or, or control, which is certainly uh, it's, it's key to actually um, to differentiate between those two uh, um, situations. However, we don't have the capacity at the moment to actually be able to um, differentiate those two different um, types of impact. The second one is the most important part, the research study on the human impact. We are glad that we were able to, to contract a human rights expert and our new conflict analyst in Colombia who was able to actually bring in the nexus of human, 
human rights and humanitarian operations in the country. So we would like to to actually quanti uh, quantify how what are the impacts of living under the chronic inf influence and control of armed groups in the country in rural areas, because our seven million people live only in rural areas. The number would be higher if we would also include urban areas, but urban areas are it's complex to actually estimate the number of people who are under control influence and who are not. And so we're doing this research in, in joint collaboration with OHCHR and Human Rights Watch. And to to follow up on the on the report of ICRC, which was Alison mentioned earlier in, in the call. But I think the most important part will be the situation of the results of the research study with all stakeholders involved, because well, research papers are, are, are a good start, but the real work is afterwards to find solutions to to the impact. And here we still need to to work to and to create a plan on how we will socialize and use those results to leverage it and to make a change with the new administration which comes into to place this year in the second half of the year. And we would like to actually have an action plan on how to improve the protection of affected people with the human rights um, law, the, sorry, the human rights law perspective. And that's all from my side. I'm happy to answer any questions or to, if you have any guidance or any, any recommendations, I'm also happy to receive them. Thank you. Over to you, Valerie. Thank you so much, Gillian. And uh, there is a lot going on in Colombia. I understand the research is not yet uh, finalized and public, but I am sure this group would be uh, very keen to see then the report once it's possible to share it in a few weeks time, maybe if it's possible. And I must say also your uh, intervention made me think on the point how to differentiate between influence and control how, uh, where to draw the line, <laughs> you know. So a lot of uh, interesting points that are, of course, the reality on the ground in many of the countries where we work. Um, very, very concrete example from Colombia, um, but I'm sure colleagues uh, in many countries can relate to that as well. So thank you so much, uh, Julian, uh, for sharing uh, those two examples with us. And now we will move to the third panelist, um, Kiran Kotari uh, from Save the Children uh, to continue our experience sharing. So over to you, please, Kiran. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks, Valerie and Alison, for the opportunity. And uh, really interesting to hear from uh, Pascal, who I and we at Save the Children know very well. And uh, we appreciate Geneva call very, very much. And we appreciate Pascal's work, but also interesting to hear from Julian. Um, just uh, as a bridge, you know, Save the Children has presented some recent research and uh, kind of experience learning on community led negotiations to the Alliance for Child Protection, but also to the Global Protection Cluster in previous webinars. And I can uh, kind of dig out the links and, and share that uh, with you all, but I think you may be aware of that. Um, I've been asked to sort of look a little bit more strategically and try and think a little bit about um, how Save the Children works and to kind of explain that as a means of, of really focusing on it. I'll try and keep my time to about five minutes and then uh, take questions or, or continue um, as we see fit. Um, so in terms of how Save the Children works, you know, I'll tell you a little bit about our team. We're, we're four advisors. We focus on relations with armed actors, uh, kind of access, negotiations, but it's relational. And we do both relations and there we kind of put in a lot of the normative dialogues around advocacy, things that you would normally consider advocacy. Um, but then we also look at the transactional side and trying to improve uh, kind of very practical access for our services, but also communities access to us in those dialogues that we have with people who either uh, control or influence our presence in a given situation. So that's kind of how we think about it. Our aim is to speak to all actors uh, directly. That's our preferred thing, so is that we manage the relationship ourselves or that our frontline colleagues do that. And when we can't, we work with intermediaries. So Geneva Call uh, colleagues uh, sometimes have excellent connections, but also sometimes it's Fight for Humanity, another uh, kind of relative newcomer, but also carrying lots and lots of experience, including from uh, um, Geneva Call past. So those could be our kind of international intermediaries or connectors, but then also as a development and uh, kind of humanitarian situation actor, we 
we also often have strong ties to communities that may then go into a period of conflict. And that is also something that we can uh, very much capitalize on and it stands us in a very strong way. Then, you know, uh, more about skill sets about me. I'm based at the regional office in Amman. Um, and then, you know, I support my country office colleagues that this regional office for the Middle East and Eastern Europe uh, covers. So I work quite a lot on Yemen, Syria, Iraq, Palestine, Lebanon, and because it's also Eastern Europe and because we've been maintaining relations with with armed actors in Ukraine, including through longstanding past projects with Geneva Coal colleagues um, in government and non-government controlled areas in Ukraine. So we have learned a lot from uh, from all of this. But, you know, in the past 20 months, my colleagues and I have also worked on uh, high intensity visible crises like uh, Tigray and other operations in Ethiopia, Afghanistan, etc. and Mali. Um, so I joined SAVE in early 2017. I'm a war crimes investigator. And before that, I was a field researcher for a crisis group. So, you know, conflict, violence and stuff like that. The other profiles in our team are somebody who carries a lot of humanitarian experience from our context, but also um, somebody with a strong military background and somebody with a conflict and violence research background to help us manage our legal and research work. Um, so the focus is on relations, as in, you know, we have relations with armed actors so that when there's a blip in a situation or intense conflict, we can rely on those relationships that we've developed in order to communicate to them. And then we look at specific transactions or negotiations. And then how do we do that? So the closer we get to communities, the lines between advocacy and negotiations can get very blurry, right? This is it's one of the ways in which you think about it. And being prepared for that, as as most most operational actors will tell you, you're going to analyze the context, you're going to plan your interaction, and then you're going to think a little bit about uh, the transaction or the dialogue that you engage in. And then you learn and then you reanalyze, you replan and you you go back and try and have another hit. And then you communicate across that context. You rely on the communication of humanitarian partners, on uh, public communications understanding, so you understand what's happening in the communications environment. And I think that is something that is more and more important. But you also, through this analysis, if you're looking at the analysis stage, you're looking very much at, you know, trying to understand what your counterpart's position is. So what's the, what's the most visible thing about them that you see when it comes to your priorities? But then also trying to understand what their motivation is. Um, and then also to analyze the network of influence around that. And um, so you you would do kind of like a stakeholder mapping or a like a network or connectors. Who are your key key kind of investors who you would be able to influence for this desired outcome in the interest of communities or your desired outcome? And then uh, that would inform your plan. And that plan is you know you'd look at a scenario, you try and prepare as much as possible, and then you'd come back and then. You decide some bottom lines, you'd agree that with, with your colleagues, like here, what are the things that we can say? What can we put at risk? What can't we put at risk? Where can we make our compromises? And then that's what you take into your transaction. Sometimes you've got a lot of time to prepare for your dialogue, and sometimes you've got less than five minutes to prepare for a conversation. But the idea is, is that having this picture of the relations that you've got with those counterparts, that is what really helps you be prepared to conduct that dialogue. So we, we analyze and learn from all those relationships and transactions that we have ongoing at any given point in time. But the analysis would start with, you know, breaking points down. You'd, you'd really understand what's at stake. Where do we agree? Where do we disagree? Is it a kind of a factual disagreement or a factual agreement? And then you kind of know where your safe space is, you know, where the risks lie in the conversation, and then you can start plotting things out. But, you know, so here it's it's very much an action focused dialogue, but it's it's about uh, thoughtful action. Um, finally, you know, just in terms of how we also work, we try to think about who we would ally with, uh, who are our kind of obvious humanitarian partners, but also who do we work with within communities? Uh, as Pascal was thinking, or, you know, explaining uh, dialogue with religious leaders and those can be very effective and then in other contexts it can be somebody who's very close to or influential over the armed actor or somebody who gives you access so for example in detentions working maybe the prisons manager or somebody who's very close to prisons manager but there you know being a long-term actor in that context is is really beneficial for some of the riskier conversations that we uh, that we might want to have and then finally you know each one of those relationships will have different strategies so with our 
more sort of very close to the front line partners. We'd we'd look at sort of capacity building type uh, relations and engagement and exchanges with our humanitarian peers. We'd be sharing uh, kind of common advocacy messages, common messaging, thinking about uh, common uh, communications and humanitarian diplomacy approaches. And then we'd look at, you know, more influential capital level influencing, all focused on trying to mitigate the effects of potential spoilers over our outcome. But we're looking, the ideal outcome for us is a dynamic outcome where there's, uh, we are trusted by our interlocutor and the demand for our services is is kind of preferred. I'm going to stop there. I've spoken a lot uh, and that's kind of our kind of top line stuff. But in, in questions, I can come back to the kind of complicated context where we're navigating things like transnational recruitment for um, armed conflicts, uh, situations like we see right now where it's international and internationalized armed conflicts, uh, terrorism, uh, remote warfare and challenges that that faces for, for kind of protection actors, those kind of things, and how we cover that in uh, dialogues and relationships that we maintain. I can come back to all of that later. But I'll stop here. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kiran, and uh, fascinating uh, all the elements you have pointed out. And uh, I see there are some questions starting to come. Alisa, I was thinking about you and uh, the work you have been doing in uh, Niger and Congo and in uh, um, in Central African Republic and how this must resonate. So thank you for the question. Uh, we will uh, leave it now uh, until we come back to the panel. But thank you so much, uh, um, Kiran. Then I also thought about your intervention and, uh, you know, the links between or rather the blurred lines between negotiations and advocacy and <laughs> that you stressed and actually the different steps and the complexity of the process I was thinking uh, fits very well to the uh, preparations of the GPC advocacy package that I'm sure colleagues on the call are also um, uh, now uh, having in mind. So thank you so much for giving us this uh, um, this outline and picture. And we go now to the our last panelist or rather three panelists, because for one country presentation, uh, we have a wonderful team presenting uh, real teamwork. We go to Mali. And uh, in Mali, uh, we will start with a presentation by Sabrina, who is the protection cluster coordinator, then turning towards uh, Nora, who is working with UNMAS, Mine, Mine Action, and finally Frank uh, from Ocha in Mali. So over to you colleagues in Mali. I give the floor first to Sabrina and we will put uh, the slides on the screen. Over to you. Thank you, Valérie. Hello, colleagues. So we are trying to give a good example of one UN uh, approach by being uh, here together. Um, so we decided also to build this presentation, the three of us, because uh, we wanted really to focus on, um, on an issue that we are uh, facing on a regular basis in... Um, are we? Pardon. Sorry. I forgot the camera. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and a context like um, like Mali, where basically um, we faced several situations uh, of uh, besieged villages, um, where basically uh, non-state armed groups uh, took uh, the control of uh, these villages, blocked the access to these villages, etc. So one key um, challenge. Uh, we faced was uh, first to come up with a clear definition of what do we um, consider as a situation of encirclement of villages um, to 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 make sure that we we are able to build one approach um, even if each situation is has its own uh, complexity. So basically, we had several situations these last uh, two years where um, uh, some villages, Farabougou, Dinanguru, Sokolo, or Marebougou, um, were basically um, under the control of non-state armed groups, um, where we had like uh, quite a strong issue um, uh, with the use of uh, IED, um, but uh, with the same modus operandi um, in attacking uh, and destroying the infrastructures, to make sure that basically there is no means to communicate with um, the communities within the villages. Uh, so bridges were destroyed, infrastructures, um, 
uh, to ensure that there is basically no communication between um, those still in the village and uh, humanitarian actors, but not only, because in some in some situations, like for example, Marebugu, uh, even the militaries faced some um, challenges in accessing the village. Um, in terms of challenges we could see uh, in um, the different situations I just mentioned is first maybe um, the challenges in terms of having um, one level of understanding uh, because of the different channels of communications around the situation. So uh, you have like at Bamako level uh, communication between uh, at, within the HCT uh, within each cluster, within um, the ISCG, uh, and then you have the regional level. So um, it was sometimes a bit challenging. I'm sorry, Sabrina, I think um, the connection got cut. Um, can you try to reconnect if you can hear us? If not, um, Yes, we, we have you back. Uh, maybe if you can try to switch off the camera. Apologies. Yes, very good. OK, let us give it a minute uh, until they come back. In the meantime, I see the very interesting question that Stefan also put um, to the chat. Uh, so we will definitely come back to it. Uh, it's directly to Pascal, but I think actually to all uh, panelists uh, um, and it's related to the training and uh, of community actors and is there actually possible harm that, uh, uh, that they could lose? And I see that we have colleagues now back from Mali, so we go back uh, to them and the presentation we continue. So over to you, please, uh, Sabrina and Nora. Thank you. So, so basically there was like uh, a lot of meetings, but not one harmonized way um, to, to understand what were the needs uh, that need to be addressed. Um, so, so basically, uh, this question of who will be the right linkages between the different level uh, was a kind of challenge. Um, also, maybe sometimes, uh, even if we know that some needs were quite critical to address uh, because of uh, um, the, the life-saving part of it, um, having access to food was uh, critical, having access sometimes to um, to drinkable water was critical, etc. But sometimes it was also difficult to understand um, what centrality of protection means uh, in such context, um, especially because uh, in such situation we might have also some critical protection aspects that needs to be also addressed, like the risk of children associated to um, to, uh, to armed groups or also um, um, IED, um, IED issues. I will let uh, Nora develop on that. Um, but also um, maybe uh, a point that is uh, quite important and that we try to raise on a regular basis is the lack of flexibility. Uh, from humanitarian actors to, to build ad hoc interventions uh, in areas where uh, actors are not necessarily present due to the constraint imposed by the donors uh, when they fund like some, um, some uh, interventions in some specific location, but then you have for example, issues occurring in a, in a location where um, we don't have like uh, partners uh, present, etc. So uh, it can be um, it can be an issue. Um, in terms of opportunities uh, and maybe um, uh, good practice that need to be strengthened, um, what we identified is clearly uh, how we can strengthen uh, the community-based protection approach. Um, especially uh, to f but to find like a way at least to continue to collect um, on a regular basis information when we have key informant, um, when we have focal points present in these villages, etc., to at least disseminate key information um, on some key protection aspect, etc. Um, but also um, in order to to help us to 
um, to, to, to maintain kind of protection monitoring of the situation by spotting like the, the, the key risk, by spotting like um, uh, the, the person in needs, etc., um, that needs like uh, urgent assistance, etc. I think um, for this specific aspect, we need, uh, of course, to continue to think about how to maintain the right balance to not expose uh, this, um, this, um, this focal point or key informant, it depends on how we want to call them. Uh, but it's, uh, it's quite critical because we are also in a context where often um, this key informant, even in, um, let's say, regular protection monitoring activities, are raising their concern to not be perceived as um, um, informant of, um, let's say, uh, hostile um, counterpart uh, to those controlling the area, etc. So it's really like a matter of uh, assessing uh, on a continuous basis to not, um, to not expose them. Something that come that comes up quite fre frequently is how we need to strengthen um, the cooperation with the military actors. Um, but here again, we need also to, to keep the right balance to not create uh, misperception or, or misunderstanding um, um, when we have because we have different mandate um, and also because as humanitarian actors, we don't necessarily have um, full control on how uh, military um, actors will intervene in the zone. Uh, we don't necessarily have um, a picture on uh, the, the key risk that these military actors can create in terms of uh, SEA, in terms of uh, diversion of assistance, in terms of um, um, more exposing uh, the, the civilians, etc. Uh, it's important also to, to make sure that we have kind of boundaries the way that we cooperate with them. Um, so, um, in, regarding this, uh, we try to discuss a bit with, um, with the coordinators of the different AORs. Uh, how we can maybe, um, of course, strengthen um, sensitization um, on some key protection aspect. But in the meantime, I think this is also in um, should be complemented with um, uh, the way that we work directly with the communities uh, to ensure that um, we keep uh, contact with the communities to not also uh, jeopardize. Uh, our intervention post uh, solution uh, find to this situation. Last but not least, uh, it's also identification of um, new voices for advocacy. Um, earlier, I think the colleague from Geneva call mentioned how we use the religious leaders uh, to unlock situations. I had like a bilateral discussion with Frank, maybe he will uh, get back to that later. Um, it's more how uh, maybe we identify different uh, channel of communication at different level. Um, uh, maybe uh, religious leaders in our cases to um, to at least create new doors for communication, but then negotiation should occur with like maybe more political actors, etc. And last but not least, always have a more tailored approach. Uh, the way that we identify uh, our uh, interlocutors, depending on the context, because again, the situation in Marebugu or the situation in um, in uh, Fa mm -hmm. uh, Farabugu, etc., are quite different. So we have uh, different. We need also to to ensure that we we are not um, just stuck with one uh, approach that cannot maybe uh, fit to 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 each situation. Uh, in terms of opportunities and maybe a um, new way of uh, approaching the situation, I think because we had like different um, situations, uh, it's also time for us to, um, to maybe um, uh, have like a joint exercise uh, on lesson learned, even if it was um, initiated last year, but have it like um, 
more established to um, to build maybe a principled framework on um, assistance but also interventions etc in such situation where we can draw red lines for us as humanitarian actors um, and also um, uh, to think about um, more innovative approach if we have uh, such situation occurring for example um, uh, in border areas to see how we can build like maybe a more transnational approach cooperation with um, with other countries especially because if we look at the the last um, development in the context we had like a new influx uh, of refugees uh, arriving, um, uh, especially in the region of Liptako Gourma. So arriving from Burkina Faso. In the meantime, we have also movement of uh, uh, IDPs. In the meantime, we have also refugees fleeing from Mali to entering to Burkina Faso, etc. So this should be also captured the way that we build our response. Uh, I will let maybe Nora focusing more on the IED. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would just like to ask Nora and then Frank, please, to take two minutes, just one example, and we will go back uh, more into details in the discussion. But over to you, please, Nora. Yes, I was going to say my intervention is going to be brief. It's just to show the bridge between the protection cluster and OCHA in terms of access and negotiations. So UNMAS came into play when it comes to uh, to the, the besiegement of communities with the use of mines and IEDs that the armed groups has used against the communities to restrict their movement. So what we are trying to do in parallel to negotiating access and, uh, and dialogue with uh, that OCHA and other partners are dealing with in terms of uh, uh, responsabilizing the national authorities and also uh, facilitating access that Frank, uh, Frank will talk about. Our work was more into uh, improving risk education approaches with the communities to make sure that they are being informed about the risk of uh, explosive ordnance and how to get protected. So what we were trying is to have focal points doing risk education activities in those areas, but also focusing on remote approaches such as radio campaigns and others. We are also working on a communication strategy and the behavior change strategy, taking into consideration the nature of the risk and the influencers in order to have tailored approaches and come up with innovative approaches in terms of risk education. When it comes to the protection uh, monitoring and other tools, we are also including uh, the explosive threat in those tools to, for, for two reasons, to get information about the risk, but also to be able to respond to those risks based on the evaluations that are taking place, whichever protection actor is there. So it's not only about us doing direct risk education, but also using other actors for emergency education. So this is what we are trying to do. Uh, also, what we're trying to do, uh, uh, because it's a conflict that is active, so we could not do humanitarian depollution, and that's why the, the, the humanitarian coordinator was negotiating depollution with the national authorities uh, through a program that UNMAS has supported the national authorities in building their capacities in terms of EOD and IED threat mitigation. So this is in a nutshell. We're trying to get ourselves in the protection tools to make sure we have access and at the same time working in parallel with OCHA. And now I leave the the voila, the floor to uh, Frank to explain more how access is being negotiated. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Nora. Thank you, Valerie, for giving me the floor. I will try to have it in. Uh, okay, you could be soon. I will try to have it in uh, less than one minute. I'm not sure, but <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will just focus on uh, how we we get involved in the negotiation negotiation of access. And uh, as uh, Sabina motion, c'est pas où? Tu es là la caméra. Je suis là la caméra. <laughs> Ça marche très bien. Sorry, Frank, now we cannot hear you. Sorry. I'm afraid it was working very well before the headphones. Okay. Now so, it's very good. Yes. Yes, thank you. So I, think I will just focus on how the the mentors are engaged in the negotiation of access and, and uh, 
what are the solution offense I mean, we, we finally um, decided to, to implement basically uh, as the situation has been well described by by uh, Sabrina it's, it's we not you not have access with uh, the non state group for direct, uh, direct direct negotiation and as you know uh, our 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 strategy, our point as a mental actor are, are put through the community and community leaders who are engaged in the in the dialogue. And the particularity in the case of Mali is each of the fourth or more than that uh, situation of unsettlement, we are different, I mean, interlocutor for the non state arm group. In some cases, it was religious leader, in other cases, we had a uh, local community victims who were organized to deal with uh, the, the non-state app group and another side we had uh, organization uh, who has the capacity to negotiate access so what we do it is like for any of in all those cases we get in touch and push our opinion uh, to to get involved and have their points into to strengthen the, the peace process and uh, and lastly is to focus on how we can engage the local authority to 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 get more involved into improving security situation in the in the different area to more engage in politically and see how they can i mean i mean reduce that street because it's come to be a a tool for the non-state arm group and segment of village come to be a tool for the non-state arm group and then more and more we see the, those cases so how uh, we can make this strategy stop from that side and also to i mean mitigate our uh, our limitations to 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 to, to manage the, the process so first is to engage politically our leadership mental leadership to engage politically with local authorities and also to center the capacity of local actors to to continue i mean uh, build confidence to the to the process and lastly what i will mention is uh, how we get the, the, those processes i mean last by signature of agreement yes. between non state arm group and and uh, and the community so in this agreement give a chance for a certain moment for i mean peace and all those things but the fact is those acts those agreements comes to be very fragile and uh, how we can get opportunity for the moment to ensure that we can access and then uh, take opportunity to i mean yes to transcend our acceptance to the community and build more acceptance than talking about uh, uh, talking about uh, like uh, a mental principle and uh, how we can see more uh, mental actors neutral in all those processes. So not to be long, I mean uh, that this one, uh, yes, not to be long, but uh, finally I will mention the case of Farabugu and uh, Farabugu, Maribugu, who in some cases we had to use uh, last resort to provide assistance. And as you know, yes, last last resort to provide assistance, but also yes, 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 yes. That's just the last resort. But more and more, we have engaged local authorities to to I mean, to engage in dialogue, and uh, we are expecting that uh, the situation is going to be more uh, more good for the population. Okay, I will stop here and uh, give the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, um, all three colleagues in Mali, because you have given us a really different perspective of how you are tackling this topic in Mali from different mandates, but working together and advancing. Uh, um, and I liked a lot of examples you provided, and I see also colleagues commented in the chat. And thanks also, uh, Sabrina, for already um, partially responding to Stefan's question also on the training, engaging with the capacity, etc. So very useful. 
So now we are um, actually completing the part of the panel presentations, dear colleagues, and uh, I would like to get back the questions to the panelists, uh, those that we have received so far. And we will go with the first round of um, questions. I think we will. Uh, we have already six, six questions, which is fantastic. Uh, uh, seven more coming, and uh, I will give them now back to the panelists. But before I give you back the floor, I will also ask uh, Jamal from a local NGO in um, in Yemen to reflect on some of those questions so as to give elements of response and hear from a local partner's perspective uh, on those elements. But OK, let me summarize uh, some of the feedback we received from participants and what we heard. So there has been quite a lot of reaction on the stakeholders mapping and the importance of it. And if you can give maybe some more examples or hints, tips in relation to that. But also building on it, Carolina supported by Elodie, uh, were curious if uh, beyond the mapping, if we can also look at the interest of the influencers, if this is something which is happening, if you can give examples, um, etc. So going even step further, uh, uh, it would be interesting to hear about that. Stefan's question already uh, tackled by uh, some of the panelists, but uh, a very interesting one. Do you feel that in some instances actually the engagement with community uh, can also expose them? How do you balance the no, do no harm principles in practice? What is your experience with that? We heard also a lot about the engagement with faith based actors and others. So it would be interesting to hear back from the panelists. To continue on that, uh, further questions include, for example, if you could share some concrete examples on the messaging that works from your experience, if there is some common theme or silver thread across the different efforts that have most impact or that resonate where you see, of course, depending on the context, but if you could uh, share some examples with us, that would be very useful. Uh, I saw the exchanges in the chat around the uh, um, uh, civil uh, coordi sim coordination framework and how it could help the protection uh, sensitive approaches, how we can use it maybe more efficiently or how to find a better synergies. But also now coming from Carolina, <clears throat> Uh, another questions, uh, question on some of the challenges and possibilities of restorative justice or other community-led reconciliation repatriation reparations mechanisms. So if there are some other examples, Kiran uh, or other colleagues on the panelist, you could share. Even colleagues in the uh, in as participants, maybe you have some uh, examples, you can drop a line or raise your hand as well. And finally, to conclude uh, on putting back the questions uh, to you that have been received, a question from Sarah. Uh, if the inclusion of mine action in the peace agreement uh, help with entry and engagement with the community supported and non-term armed groups negotiations, so very specific also maybe to uh, Nora. Uh, so I will turn back to you, but I would like to first ask uh, uh, Jamal, Jamal Abdo from uh, a local partner in um, Yemen, uh, NGO called Tandir, to come uh, to us and share some reflection. Can you hear us, Jamal? Yes, uh, this is uh, Jamil Abdo from Tamdin Youth Foundation in Yemen. And... Uh, Thank you for very much for giving us the, this opportunity to talk. Uh, also, thank you for the panelists with the, the amount of information they present. Uh, uh, as you know, in Yemen here also we face uh, a lot of issues with, uh, with this because we got uh, different groups uh, controlling different areas. Uh, in terms of uh, protection and also in terms of uh, advocacy for protection. Uh, the, the context in Yemen is uh, slightly different from other world, uh, other areas. The context in Yemen here, uh, 
the people uh, or the people uh, are all most of them are armed. Uh, our, our armed group is not uh, even the, it, it's it's normal to see uh, armed weapons uh, uh, in the street. Uh, everyone at least has two to three for uh, arms uh, weapons in his house. So it's part of the tradition. It's part of uh, uh, it's part of the their uh, daily life. So uh, the uh, so it is uh, also uh, we got uh, a little bit uh, when we are starting to talk about uh, protection uh, and using uh, protection terminologies is uh, a little bit uh, sensitive for for the people also. So because one word in one area means something and. Uh, and the, the same word in the other area means uh, completely different things, 180 degrees uh, backward. So it's too difficult uh, to do this. Uh, in terms of coordination, uh, engaging the key stakeholders uh, in these issues, uh, getting the access, uh, it's normally getting the access or getting a uh, touch of uh, doing the stakeholder uh, uh, main stakeholder mapping and uh, check their uh, power influence uh, during uh, according to the power influence uh, their power and their influence on the community and to get the right uh, the right approach to them uh, using their ter terminology not uh, the overall or the word protection terminology uh, you, you we we can get uh, well, effective results, uh, effective uh, uh, cooperation. Actually, uh, in terms of access, uh, we we need to get a lot of permits uh, to do our interventions in Yemen. Uh, we you have to do it's in in one if if the project across uh, two two or three governments, uh, you need to do at least two to three permits from different parties. So uh, <laughs> this is why it's uh, working in, especially in protection uh, is a little bit challenging here in Yemen, but with the effort of the the people of fought with the local NGOs, uh, with the, the advocacy, using the advocacy, it's, it's not mean that in the public or the, in the media, but mm. during the meetings, during uh, negotiation, also uh, pre-coordination with the authorities or with the uh, group with uh, with the main the main stakeholder prior to implementing any project that uh, shows an effective uh, results uh, for this. Thank, Thank you. you so much, uh, Jamal. I think I see a lot of reactions for Kiran as you were speaking because I think this resonates in your experience as a local actor and really being at the forefront. And the point you mentioned on the sensitivity of the language, the terminology, how it can mean something else to different uh, uh, groups of people, individuals, how we need to be more careful um, and targeted and sensitive. This is very, very important. Thank you so much, uh, Jamal. Thank you. Very good. So um, I we go back to our dear panelists uh, with the questions I just mentioned and maybe I would give first the floor back to Pascal. Over to you, Pascal and panelists, if you can put the cameras uh, as you take the floor, that would be fantastic. Over to you. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the very interesting questions and, and discussion. Um, on, on the do no harm principle, of course, this is very important and, and we try to not expose um, community actors or partners we are, we are, we are working with uh, to additional risk by mainly focusing on um, CBOs or actors that have already pre-existing uh, relationship with the, the armed group. So they are already somehow accepted. Sometimes they are part of the constituency and um, but they agree with our objectives and I can give you an example of the Sahrawi campaign to ban landmines which is a, a CBOs in, in Western Sahara, in the refugee camps, and um, they, they have been very much helping us with Sahrawi Mine Victims Association, 
uh, that are often former Polisario Front um, combatants that have been war victims. And they have helped us to engage with the Polisario Front to, um, to um, uh, convince them to abandon the use of this weapon, which they did. And then they destroyed the stockpiles and then they've been collaborating with mine action organizations, including ICRC uh, on victim assistance. So this is what we try is really to focus on uh, partners that are somehow already um, they've been engaged in an ongoing dialogue with the, the armed actor. Uh, but of course, we when we come in, we, we, we try to involve them in kind of, you know, uh, the engagement strategy. The, the, the arguments, the messaging, uh, the additional risk assessment. So we try to also really much involve them in, in the engagement uh, process, not just, you know, prioritizing us and, and, and basically, um, you know, uh, imposing our, our, our ideas or conceptions. Uh, in some contexts, there are new partners, uh, but we try to test the waters with stakeholders or the armed groups to what extent, you know, they may be accepted. And I remember uh, an example in DRC, North Kivu, where we were figuring out, so we tried to, to I would say, explore, test the waters first to make sure that um, there is no, no um, you know, unnecessary uh, risk taking. So far, I don't think we had really uh, burning issues, but of course, it's always a big concern, especially in contexts where you have many different armed groups uh, fighting each other, fighting with together, splitting, uh, fragmenting. So at the end of the day, you don't know who is who, and and and, and there is a lot of of, um, of confusion. Now, when it comes maybe to the question of um, the the incentives and if there are any arguments that maybe can help to engage better with armed groups. I mean, of course, uh, it's very important when you you start engaging uh, to have a very deep knowledge of the armed group profile, of its objectives, of its structure, of its modus operandi. And, and part of that, I think it was mentioned by Jamal, is to understand what is the values or the ideology behind and how we can it articulate our goals, uh, international standards in a ways that resonate for them, whether it is with a religious frame of reference, whether it is local norms, uh, traditional, um, you know, way of, of uh, honor, you know, warrior code of conduct, like in, in some countries. And it's very important to try to look at any internal regulation they have. Many of these armed groups, they have some kind of code of conduct. They have some kind of uh, policies or rules of behavior or sometimes they have even made statements or agreements with other organizations. So it's very important to um, to start not from uh, to start from there, to start from this, uh, their own discourse, their own narrative and, and build on that and then hold them accountable. Uh, so we, we actually are engaged in, in another project, research project that look at the perspective and practice of armed groups and looking at different, uh, you know, types of armed groups and to look at how they position themselves on IHA with different thematics. Um, and it's very important to, to, um, to analyze that because that could actually uh, provide some entry points uh, that would be useful. And I think to frame our engagement in the kind of mental universe or, or, or logic of the group is very important. And for that, local partners, but also experts of the groups can really help to understand um, you know, these this insights. Um, for, for other armed groups that have de facto authority on a territory that are under pressure from the population to deliver services, that could also provide another avenue to engage with them because they actually need support from the from specialized or, or, or human organizations. And that could provide some, some uh, you know, additional um, entry point. There are other groups that are searching for international legitimacy. Uh, often peace processes, I think it was mentioned, provide some very good avenues or windows of opportunities because they may have, they may actually, you know, be more open to change the policy. And I can give you the example of the FARC in Colombia back in 2016 uh, or even before. They had, on child protection, for example, they had very uh, 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 straight 15 years policy, but through the engagement, through the peace process, they finally increased the age of recruitment. And they were much more open also to uh, to um, joint demining uh, agreements, 
um, with with the government or with uh, international actors. So that are really some kind of timely uh, moment that you can seize to uh, to engage with the group because because it can be more open to uh, our uh, you know uh, objectives or uh, discourse. Thank you so much, Pascal. Uh, you have really uh, gotten. Uh, we just saw your video now. Um, it is sorry, a... I thought I put the camera, but sorry, I think I messed up. No, okay, thank okay. you so much. Uh, it was great. Uh, Kiran, uh, over to you and then Sabrina. Hi, so I had a couple of questions. One was on stakeholder mapping and, you know, sort of uh, is there a dominant framing of messages that we tend to use? No, it's very situation specific. It's about that specific conversation. Um, so then, you know, you find the right uh, kind of conversation. You break the issue down into whether it's factual or is it normative? Uh, you would think, you know, uh, that advocacy is only about respect for norms, right? That's kind of how we tend to regard it as as kind of advocates. So, you know, I'm, I'm I'm a lawyer by training, and I, I would tend to think about it like that. But really, on the front line, it's it's just you know you have so many competing values, right? You've got the values that the community has, and those could be customary norms, and there's customary practice. So a classic example is it's okay. For example, let's say you take LTE control area. It's not accepted practice. Family members were very upset about the recruitment of children, but it was a, a kind of a norm in LTT control area that uh, one child per family would be recruited by the LTT. For example, I'm using historic examples deliberately so as not to go into a specific operational context right now. Um, but then, you know, if you if that's a customary norm, the the actual legal norm that we look at as principal international humanitarian actors is, you know, uh, the uh, um, like let's say strict 18 that's what uh, the optional protocol on children on conflict tells us and the crc so that's what we would would choose to respect so that's the kind of then you have this this thing about the competing norms and then how would you challenge that is you would really look at who are you having your dialogue with is it somebody that's very local that you're trying to influence to to move their position and there you know um it could be really interesting to look at the historic work that Geneva Call did and to see the uh, the fact that they got the ELN to move and, and FAP to move into that um, uh, the strict 18 uh, thing. So I, th I think there's a lot to be gotten out of um, that particular kind of analysis. That's one. Um, so it is different for each context. It's different for each conversation, but you will also need to know. But if you're going back repeatedly over time, you're going to understand, you know, this is the position that you're trying to build and you're going to find building blocks. So then I would break it down into, you know, are you looking at what's the local system of values? What are the kind of international applicable norms? What are the international standards? Um, and then what national laws uh, can apply? And then that tells you how to structure your dialogue depending on whether you're speaking to trying to get uh, a group of allies of, of kind of those who would agree with your international norms. So you, you get them to coalesce around that and you get the local values to, to to kind of coalesce around a position where you're more or less respecting this, the international norm, but you, you really challenge it if it's if it's undermining it. And then that gives you a pathway for your your kind of your advocacy conversation. That's the the initial mapping. And then you, you would build that on your stakeholder map, right? Your network of influence. And then you kind of know which approach to take with which actor. So it gives you a bit more of a clear plan. But then having that map, which is on one page, will help you also communicate to your colleagues and to your, your peers at the different organizations that you're trying to cooperate with. So you can build momentum on one very quick, easy shared picture. Um, that's uh, one question. Uh, the other question was on accountability. And there, you know, I think a very good example, uh, I, I don't work for Geneva Call, but Geneva Call did a lot of research on accountability in LTT controlled areas. And I remember that when I was working in Sri Lanka, I remember that research coming out and it being something very important. But I would also look at, you know, the examples of Nepal from how the Maoists exerted uh, control over the population. But we also have seen this very recently in kind of IS controlled areas and the means in which IS and other actors use to control populations under their control. So I think we learn a lot from all of those those contexts and not all of them are really positive. But for example, in LTT controlled areas, one of the things that we knew is that incidences of domestic violence 
in LTTE controlled areas as opposed to government of Sri Lanka controlled areas. Domestic violence was very low in LTTE controlled areas because the LTTE would just come to your house and beat you up if you were abusing your child or your wife. So you know you would you would see some of uh, those kind of things. Not not exactly the greatest way of dispensing justice, but you know there are there are things that that we can understand from those contexts. Um, I'll stop there and I can take any other questions if, if colleagues want me to clarify on other points. Thanks. So interesting, Kiran. Thank you so much for sharing also those concrete examples. And all panelists, please, if you have uh, links to those uh, um, different research uh, pieces or interesting projects, if there is any kind of uh, uh, availability also online, I'm sure colleagues would uh, really appreciate that if possible to share. But now over to colleagues uh, in Mali, please. Thanks, Valérie. Uh, Okay, sorry, we have to make. Perfect. Um, uh, I would like just to go back a bit on um, the do no harm uh, uh, question, uh, because I think um, sometimes we need also to use our uh, grandma common sense and just uh, don't forget to just ask our key informant or uh, focal point how they feel um, with the situation. If I take the example of Mali, we are in, in a very complex uh, context where even within the communities, we know that we have different dynamic. So, uh, so I think it's important. Uh, sometimes we could see even through uh, our monitoring activities how um, the community members are quite uh, stressed by the, the dynamic, uh, the, the level of paranoia, uh, paranoia is quite high uh, because they don't know who is who, etc. cetera. Um, so, so I think it's quite important to first ask them how they feel with that. So, um, so in the case of, for example, um, uh, Farabougou, uh, I know that uh, the colleagues were on a regular basis checking um, with the focal point there and the focal point uh, himself uh, mentioned that he was not feeling comfortable. Um, so uh, he uh, clearly said that he uh, do not want to continue to communicate, uh, to not expose uh, further himself. So basically, I think it's, uh, I mean, discussing with also community members um, require from our side to constantly check how do they feel um, with this channel of communication, etc. I think it's, I mean, it's quite key for us. Over. Thank you so much, Sabrina, and also providing further elements of response to Stefan's and Ali's questions. So, Sorry, um, Valérie, Frank, to add yes. something. Yes, please. Yes, over to you, Nora. Yeah. Or Frank, sorry. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yes. Since in the do no harm issue, since in the do no harm issue, yes, our approach now is to avoid direct intervention with, uh, I mean, the non-state arm group. Yes, because we don't have access to, to them, but also how the perception of the population of the, I mean, uh, community can be damaged if we get involved in the, uh, in the way we can be involved in the, the, the so I mean what we can what what how we can I mean we can get involved in the issue of uh, mapping all the community actors who are involved in those such or who may have the capacity to get involved in those such uh, discussion because let be sure that even if we are now uh, mixed operation trying to I mean uh, Push all those non snit arm group, the the three twelve to still have the the insignia of glitch are uh, still there, and also we 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 have to I mean bear on the the capacity the local capacities to 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 support access issues for instance. So I mean the point is for for my side to how we can map all the those capacity local capacities. And how we can, I mean, some the capacity in uh, the issue of humanitarian, I mean, uh, principle, and uh, then to, to, to be sure that in any cases uh, we can, I mean, 
we can, I mean, get, I mean, if you are not involved, but we can, I mean, uh, how our points involved in the processes and also uh, even if uh, we, we we participate, uh, community may know our points. That's a, a, a one thing. And also what we try to do anytime is in the case we have uh, we have been engaged in the last resort, uh, the, the, we get, we pay attention on the communication, communication from the military, we provide the assistance and also communication of the authorities on the kind of support we, we might have received from the uh, from the humanitarian community. So the communication should not, I mean, engage our action in the, the I mean, in the, the communication and also the conclusion should not present the the action, the, the, the action as an humanitarian action also. So advocacy was made for the military and uh, and certain authorities here to make sure that in any cases we support for the uh, I mean the last results. Uh, I mean they pay attention on the fact that we are not involved in but also we are sure that the community are not getting uh, are not being uh, are not going to be attacked after the 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 I mean the, the assistance that the, the matter received also. This is basically we pay attention on it in the case of Marabugu. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Frank, for this very concrete example and complementing the do no harm. Over to you, Thank you. Thank you so much. Colleagues, we have reached uh, um, actually the end of the time allocated. Uh, unfortunately, I'm sure uh, Nora and other colleagues uh, would have elements to say. Nora, may I invite you please to summarize maybe a few points in the chat for colleagues uh, and apologies to cut, but I know most colleagues will need to disconnect in one minute, unfortunately. Uh, and of course, this is a dialogue. This is a dialogue that will continue. Uh, it will was prompted based on a request from the field and as Alison uh, mentioned, but it's a continuous practice and we would hope to engage with you with colleagues uh, um, in the field of sharing by collecting your good examples, practice examples, but also the challenges and information on where we can support you going further, uh, the advocacy task team as well as the human rights uh, engagement task team, because we are here for you in whatever way uh, you find um, maybe most impactful or relevant. And uh, um, Alison, I see you are on camera. Would you like to add a few words uh, before we close? No, just that. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to you, okay. Valerie, but to all of our speakers and to everyone But that. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Alison. Indeed, a big thanks goes uh, to our speakers from global level to Mali, to Colombia, to Yemen, uh, and the wealth of examples, experiences you have shared with us. Um, and uh, um, we hope that we will continue that going forward. And if you have any further resources you would like to share with this group, we will definitely also um, bring it forward and continue this discussion. If you are interested, uh, the next uh, peer exchange webinar is actually already next week um, on 15th of March at 10 o'clock. It will focus on a collaboration of one of the special procedures mandates, uh, the working group on arbitrary detention. So we will uh, discuss how we can uh, better use this mandate, what are the possible uh, uh, synergies and collaborations, and uh, uh, here are some examples also of impact of engagement with them. So this is the plan, but if you have other themes, we would be happy to hear them. And uh, I see now all the panelists uh, nearly on the, on the screen. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, dear colleagues. Uh, hope you enjoyed this uh, peer exchange uh, thematic webinar and look forward to reconnecting again soon. Thank you very much. Uh, thank Thanks you very so. much. And thank you so much, Nora, for also putting it in the chat. This is excellent, very useful, and I think we will need to have a dedicated session on mine action actually for this very complex and important topic. So thank you so much, Nora and everybody. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci à tous.